This is the Yay or Nay Show with Alex C. A sports show for sports fans by a sports fan. And now, here is Alex C. Okay, let's get right to it. There's a lot of stuff to get into today, so let's just get right into this. We've been talking about this for a while. Um, you got quarterback rankings. You got power rankings in the NFL, power rankings in the NBA. There's just a lot of stuff. But we did the quarterback rankings last week. What I told you was, out of the top 39 quarterbacks, I wanted to talk about the quarterbacks, you know, whether they're above average, average, or below average. I was going to do a fourth category, but then I'm like, hmm. We'll just do average, above average, and below average. Um, and we're going to go all through the 39 that are on this list. And then we are going to move over because, again, we've got a lot of power rankings, a lot of stuff to go over. There's a lot of stories. I don't know if we're going to get to everything. Once again, today, there's a lot of stuff to go over. Not necessarily enough time. Urban Meyer, a lot of talk still going on about him. Again, seems like there's this big conspiracy against Urban Meyer. Hopefully, we'll have time to talk about it today. If not, We'll talk about it tomorrow. Then we got Monday Night Football. We've got the Cardinals. We've got the Rams. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, like I said, just a lot of stuff to get through, so let's get this started. So let me put on my handy-dandy glasses here. Jake Fromm coming in at number 39 for the New York Giants. Um, you know what? We don't know. Okay, we're going to have to put them. We don't know. There's not enough of a sample size on Jake Fromm. So we will say we don't know when it comes to Jake Fromm. Uh, Davis Mills. Look, I personally think I know a lot of people kind of think he's good and they think that he has promise. Uh, but again, I'm not here to talk about promise or anything along those lines. Davis Mills, from what I have seen so far, I get it against the Seahawks. He threw for over 300 yards. Sounds great. But at the end of the day, he's not winning games. So I'm going to put Davis Mills for now. I'm not saying this will be his career. I'm not saying this is where he's heading. I'm saying this is where he sits right now, but I'm going to put Davis Mills on the below average list. Uh, Taysom Hill, same thing, below average. And I don't think that Taysom Hill, in all honesty, can be a starting quarterback in the NFL. Based on everything I've seen, based on everything I know, uh, I'm going to tell you Taysom Hill, to me, is not a starting quarterback in the NFL. Mike Glennon, again, sample size, not large enough. We'll leave it at that. P.J. Walker, same thing, sample size. Not large enough. You know, you got to see people in multiple games. You got to see people for half season. You got to see them through a lot of different situations because football is very situational. All sports are, but football uh, more so than others, in my opinion. Uh, and again, P.J. Walker, we haven't seen enough of a sample size. Trevor Simeon, below average, without a doubt. Um, I think we've seen more than enough. I think we have watched him through a lot of different situations. And I think it's safe to say Trevor Simeon, Below average. Andy Dalton, below average. Tyrod Taylor, um, average. We'll say average for Tyrod Taylor. Jared Goff, look, I know there's this big thing going on in L.A. with the current quarterback. I said at the beginning of the season all they were doing was training quarterbacks. I still believe that. Even after last night's game with the Cardinals, I still believe that. All you did was trade quarterbacks. This one just happens to be younger than the ones the Rams currently have. So, Jared Goff, I am going to say he's above average. He just doesn't have anything to work with in Detroit. And if they get him some weapons in the upcoming offseason, I think we'll see a different Jared Goff next year, provided the Lions don't jump off of him, and I don't think they should. So, Jared Goff, above average. Cam Newton, um, below average. I mean, you know what? I... I had high expectations. I had high hopes. We won't call them expectations. We'll call them hopes. I had high hopes for Cam Newton, but let's face it, he's below average. Uh, Gardner Minshew, above average, needs more opportunities. There's no other way to say it. Above average needs more opportunities, Gardner Minshew. Daniel Jones, below average, does not deserve to be a starting quarterback in the NFL. Justin Fields shows promise. We're going to say average uh, as a rookie. I'll even say maybe even a little above average. He showed great heart. He showed great ability against Green Bay the other night. Uh, so for Justin Fields, as a rookie, we'll say above average. As a quarterback, we're going to say average for now. Not saying that's how his career is going to be. Just saying that's where he sits at the moment. Zach Wilson, 
I know a lot of national guys would rail against me when I say this, but Zach Wilson um, is below average. He's not average. He's definitely not above average. He is below average. Now I get it. He's got a below average coaching staff, and we're going to go through and rate the coaches one of these days as well. And he's got a below average coaching staff. And I agree. I understand. I get it. Makes sense. But at the end of the day, you're still the one touching the ball every time you're on the offensive side of the ball. Zach Wilson showing me below average ability for an NFL quarterback. Teddy Bridgewater, um, a big disappointment, high expectations not delivering below average. Ben Roethlisberger, regressing, getting worse each and every week, getting worse each and every season. I've been saying for the last seven years to anybody who would listen that Ben Roethlisberger should either retire or the Pittsburgh Steelers should have forced him to retire seven years ago. They haven't won playoff games. They haven't won championships. They've done nothing, and he has done nothing, and he's consistently and constantly hurt and battling injury. Ben Roethlisberger at this moment, and I get it, he's going to probably be a Hall of Famer, although that's not saying much because, in my opinion, it doesn't take much to be a Hall of Famer anymore. But he's probably going to be a Hall of Famer. He did win a Super Bowl. But right here, right now, in this moment, Ben Roethlisberger is a below-average quarterback. Baker Mayfield, big disappointment, big ego, not big on talent. He is average. He's not below average. He's not above average. He is average. He is a guy you can win a lot of games with. However, his ego gets in the way. Currently, right now, he's trying to play injured when he shouldn't. And again, last night, OBJ proved a lot in regards to who really the problem is in Cleveland. It wasn't OBJ. The problem didn't immediately get fixed on the offensive side of the ball because OBJ left. Matter of fact, one could say OBJ's problems have now been fixed since he left and went to play in L.A. Now you're seeing who and what OBJ is as a wide receiver in the NFL. And Baker Mayfield, well, again, he's average, but his ego hurts him and he shouldn't be playing. Baker Mayfield, again, average. Trevor Lawrence, we're going to say average. And as a rookie, he's surprisingly, as the number one pick, Not the best rookie in the lot. He's really just not. Jimmy Garoppolo, despite what the national media tries to tell you, despite what the four-letter network tries to tell you, he's above average. And I'll say what I've been saying all season long. Do not be surprised if the San Francisco 49ers extend another contract out to Jimmy Garoppolo. How large will it be? Don't know. Would I be surprised? Am I looking for him to get re-signed? Yes. He, I believe, will still be with the 49ers next year. Uh, Jalen Hurts, he is on the way up, but he is average at this point in time. He's got a lot to learn. He's got a lot of work to do, but Jalen Hurts is a lot better than what the national media is trying to tell you. But right now, at this moment, he's average, but he is on the uptick. Taylor Heineke, he's average. You can win a lot of games with him, but you can't win big games with him. Cracks under pressure, doesn't have a big arm, doesn't have a good idea on how to read a defense. Once you put an above average defense in front of Taylor Heineke, he tends to crumble. He is an average quarterback. Matt Ryan, regressing every year, getting worse every week. You don't know what you're going to get. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Right now, I would say Matt Ryan used to be above average. Currently, right now, he's just average. Ryan Tannehill. I know national media, I'm even one of the people that have always said this, Ryan Tannehill's not really that good, he's not bad, he's not horrible, but he's not that good. He's not a guy you could put a team on his shoulders and win some games with. Being proven wrong this year, he's doing it without Derrick Henry, he's doing it without his wide receivers, continues to find ways to win games. He's got the team rallying around him. That's what a leader does, that's what a starting quarterback in the NFL does. Ryan Tannehill, right now, at this moment, above average. Absolutely. Carson Wentz, he is who we thought he is. He's above average. National media, again, will rail against him. They don't like him for whatever the reason is. They don't like him. Don't know why. Granted, he gets injured. So what? Everybody gets injured. And the way that they don't practice hard anymore explains why all these players are getting injured. 
Carson Wentz, above average. Tua, tug of Viola, another quarterback. National media will rail against me on. They're going to say he's below average. They're going to say Miami's looking to move off of him for a reason. I would make the argument Miami needs to look at moving off the current coach. He's not the answer for the Miami Dolphins. Tua, he's average. He's on the uptick. There's a lot of upside to Tua. But right now, at this moment, average. Kirk Cousins, let's be honest, we've all known this for a long time. He's average. He's a guy who can win you a lot of games, but he cannot win you the games. He is average. He needs a lot of help if you want to get over the hump, make it to the playoffs, and have a shot at even just getting to the NFC Championship game. Kirk Cousins, average. Mac Jones, above average as a rookie, above average as a quarterback. National media will rail against me and say, oh, you don't understand. He's just playing in a system, and he's just sitting inside the system, and it's all about the system. I don't care about the system. I don't. I get it. Cam Newton looked good inside the system too. Cam Newton in the system is why I had high expectations when he took over for Carolina. But for a rookie, as a rookie, to be able to come and do what Mac Jones is doing, that shows me he's an above average quarterback. Because I remember another quarterback who you guys call the GOAT. And as a rookie, while he looked okay, He didn't look like Mac Jones. Mac Jones is an above average quarterback, despite what the national media is going to try and tell you. Derek Carr, average. Look, he's got no weapons. He's got an unfocused team. He doesn't even have a coach right now. Hard to even judge him. I feel bad even trying, but I said I would, so I'm going to. And again, I feel bad because Derek very well may be an above average. I've always had a lot of respect and love for this guy's game. But right now, at this moment, Derek Carr is an average quarterback. Russell Wilson, seriously, do we even need to have this conversation? Above average, not even a question. Lamar Jackson, a lot of national media guys, again, they're like 50-50 in regards to when it comes to Lamar Jackson. They got a lot of hate. They got a lot of love. I'm telling you right now, he is a complete quarterback. He is a true option quarterback. You can do everything with this guy because he has all of the skill sets required to run any type of offense you want to run. That is why it is so easy for John Harbaugh to coach him up. He has all the skill sets to do anything you want to do offensively, which is why Lamar Jackson is an above average quarterback. Matthew Stafford, again, he is above average. He's always been above average. Him and Jared Goff, the switch was just that, a switch. You can enter, you know, change either one of these two quarterbacks. And I'm telling you right now, you're going to get the same result. One is not better than the other. It's just one is younger than the other. And one is maybe more durable than the other. And I would give that award to Matthew Stafford. But above average, he is. But better than Jared Goff? I don't know. I want to see what happens with a Detroit Lions team that has some weapons. But I think they are one and the same quarterback. And I don't think we're getting any results this year that we wouldn't be getting if Jared Goff were still the quarterback for the Los Angeles Rams. Josh Allen. Again, national media, they're going to rail against me because they've been trying to convince you all year long that he's worth the contract that he's getting, that he's so great. He's a top five quarterback. No, he's not. He's not a top five quarterback in anything. He is average at best, can't carry a team runs too much, doesn't sit in the pocket, doesn't have the ability to read a defense, doesn't have the ability to command the respect from his offense to run an offense the way an NFL offense needs to be run. Josh Allen is a below, no, 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 average, not below, is an average quarterback. He's just below what the national media tries to tell you he is. Justin Herbert, Absolutely agree. He is an above average quarterback. I don't think anybody in the national media would disagree with me on that. Joe Burrow. Okay, I get it. Lately, he's had some bad outings. I get it. I understand it. I agree with that. Even with that being said, he is still an above average quarterback in the NFL. Absolutely deserves to be a starting quarterback in the NFL. And he is without a doubt a top 10, currently 
currently in the current market, he is a top 10 quarterback in the NFL. Dak Prescott, average. Again, national media. I know he's the darling of the national media. They're going to rail against me. They're going to tell you how great he is. Oh, Dak Prescott, you can't go wrong. Really? Look at his performance. The eye test. The eye test. That's what I go by. I'm not worried about stats. And even if you look at the stats, folks, uh, they're not really that good if you think about it. But the bottom line is the eye test. You can see Dak Prescott not commanding an offense. He's got all the weapons in the world. He's got two running backs. He's got three star wide receivers. One of the top offensive lines in the NFL. And he still can't do anything offensively with the ball. He is weak. It's the defense winning games, which means, again, that shows you how wrong the national media is when they try to tell you he's a top, what, three quarterback in the NFL? No, he's not. He's got all the weapons, and he still can't blow anybody away. He's still losing games he should not be losing. Dak Prescott is average at best. At best, average. And in all honesty, I could have said below average, but average. Because if I'm being realistic and I look at the entire body of work, he's average. Kyler Murray, above average. Nobody can dispute that. Tom Brady, above average. No one can dispute that. Patrick Mahomes, at this moment, right here, right now, this season, forget the body of work that was done prior to this season. Because we're talking about in this moment, right here, right now, this season, Patrick Mahomes is a, he was below average, and he just graduated to average. He has a team that's winning games because of the defense, not because of the offense. Two games scoring a bunch of points against the Las Vegas Raiders does not make you a potent offense or a potent quarterback because, again, it was against the Las Vegas Raiders, a team without a head coach. They got a lot of outside noise. We all know the stories about what's happened with a couple of their players. Too many distractions, too many things going wrong. Vegas is not focused on football. Scoring a bunch of points on them is not that hard to do. Patrick Mahomes hasn't done that against anybody else. Two weeks in a row prior to the game against Vegas, by the way, which again is easy pickings. And the two prior games, no touchdowns. Aaron Rodgers, well, need I say more? Above average. Absolutely, positively, without a doubt. There's no way in the world anybody could say anything different other than Aaron Rodgers is above average when it comes to quarterbacks. All right, now let's switch over to the NBA. Uh, New power rankings out for the NBA. Let's go over and talk about these power rankings. We're going to go from number 30 to number one in regards to the power rankings on who the best teams are in the NBA. Uh, We did this a week ago, but a lot of games have been played since. So let's see where we stand since the last time we did this. Detroit Pistons coming in at number 30 with a record of 4-22. and Then you got the Orlando Magic coming in at number 29 with a record of 5-23. and Oklahoma City Thunder coming in at number 28 with a record of 8-18. and At number 27, the New Orleans Pelicans coming in with a record of 8-21. and And of course, you know, the bad news in regards to their superstar who isn't going to be playing anytime soon. Uh, number 26, Houston Rockets coming in with a record of 8-18. and at number 25, Sacramento Kings coming in with a record of 11 and 16. Indiana Pacers coming in at number 24 with a record of 12 and 16. San Antonio Spurs coming in at number 23 with a record of 10 and 16. The Portland Trailblazers coming in at number 22 with a record of 11 and 16. The New York Knicks coming in at number 21 with a record of 12 and 15. The Minnesota Timberwolves coming in at number 20 with a record of 12 and 15. The Toronto Raptors coming in at number 19 with a record of 12 and 14. Dallas Mavericks with a 500 record, 13 and 13, coming in at number 18. Boston Celtics at number 17 with a record of 13 and 14. Previous ranking was 11, so they've taken a little bit of a slide. And as of late, in all honesty, they haven't been playing that great from what I've seen. Denver Nuggets moving up from number 17 to 16 with a record of 13 and 13. The Atlanta Hawks, they're at 500 ball, 13, 13, previously ranked at number 12, coming in currently right now at number 15. Charlotte Hornets, 
previously ranked at 13, not slipping far with a 15 and 13 record. They fell to number 14. LA Lakers, previously ranked at number 18, now number 13 with a record in the NBA at 15 and 13. The LA Clippers, jumping in at number 12, formerly 16, their current record is 15 and 12. Number 11, previously ranked number 8, it's the Washington Wizards with a record of 15 and 12. The Cleveland Cavaliers, didn't I tell you they were going to make some moves? Didn't I say they were going to make some noise? I liked what I saw at the beginning of the season, and now it's coming to fruition. Cleveland Cavaliers, formerly ranked number 15, currently number 10. Their record is 16 and 12. The Memphis Grizzlies, uh, previous ranking number 10, now enjoying number nine, moving up one spot, and their current record in the NBA is 16 and 11. The Philadelphia 76ers, their current record 15 and 12. They were previously ranked number nine. They are now coming in at number eight. Chicago Bulls not able to play ball right now. They got a lot of COVID going on. Two games are suspended from what I understand. Uh, we'll see what happens. It's going to depend a lot in regards to health. They don't even have enough people to put a roster that could make them be able to have the ability to even be able to play a game in the NBA right now. However, previously their ranking was number four. Currently they're number seven. Chicago Bulls with a record of 17 and 10. Uh, hopefully they get healthy soon. Miami Heat, uh, they were previously ranked at number seven. They're currently number six. And their record as of right now is 16 and 11. Milwaukee Bucks, uh, they were currently ranked number five. They are currently still number five. Their record is 18 and 10. Uh, number four, Brooklyn Nets sliding one spot from number three to number four. Their record in the NBA right now currently is 19 and eight. The Utah Jazz making a jump to the positive, previously ranked at number six, jumping up to number three. And their record currently as of now is 19 and seven. Golden State Warriors, previously number one, currently number two. Their record right now is 21 and five. And the new number one, previously ranked number two, is the Phoenix Suns with a record in the NBA at 21 wins and four losses. And there are your current NBA power rankings. All right. So last night, big game, right? Big, big game took place last night. Of course, I'm talking about the Rams and the Cardinals. There was obviously a playoff atmosphere, without a doubt. Nobody can dispute there was a playoff atmosphere in the air between those two games, uh, teams. Sorry. Um, look, a lot of people from the talk that I was hearing today, a lot of people tried to say it was coaching that lost the game for the Arizona Cardinals. First and foremost, that's wrong. That's not true. It wasn't coaching. I get it. You could talk about clock management and they didn't go for the field goal. They went for the touchdown instead of going for the field goal. But at the end of the day, it's still going to equal out the same no matter how you slice it. It was still going to be a situation where two scores were needed. And I would make the argument, it doesn't matter how you do it. Whether you go for the field goal in the beginning or whether you go for the field goal in the end, it doesn't matter. It was still a two-score scenario that was needed. And I think you can go about it any way you want to. Again, clock management, you got to get it back. You want to only have you know, enough time needed to get a field goal after you score a touchdown. If you don't get the touchdown, you go ahead and kick the field goal. You get the ball back. It gives you plenty of time then to have to be able to go down the field, march, and get a touchdown. Look, there's a lot of ways you can do this, and there's a lot of preferences. There is no absolute perfect right or wrong answer. There's just not. No matter how you slice and dice this particular scenario, you know, analytics mean nothing to me. Because analytics don't tell you anything about the players that are actually on the field. That's what's wrong with analytics. You can get stats all you want to, but stats don't have anything to do with the players that are actually on the field or the calls that are getting made defensively or the calls that are getting made offensively. Again, you can go for the touchdown first. And if that works for you, great. Yes, you're going to have a limited amount of time on the clock left, but if you get the ball back, you're not having to do much to get into field goal range to kick the field goal. That's one philosophy. And again, the other philosophy is, you know, march down, get the toughest scoring done first, which is the touchdown. And then if you 
there, I mean, there's no right and wrong to this deal. There's just not. And, and even talking about it, you get confused and you get lost. Because again, kick the field goal. Hopefully there's a lot of clock on, left for you to march down the field and go for the touchdown. But again, if you have the ability to march down and get the touchdown first, and even though you have a limited amount of time on the clock, you still don't have to march that far to get the field goal. Either way, again, because you can get lost in this scenario. You can get totally lost in this scenario. Either way, it works. There is no right and wrong. There is no picture perfect. Score the field goal first, go for the touchdown. Score the touchdown first, go for the field goal. At the end of the day, it's all about how much clock do you have left, and it comes down to clock management. I get that. I understand that. But there's no perfect method for this. There's just not. So the coaching did not lose the game. The bad play of Kyler Murray lost the game. The fact that that defense played out of their minds for the LA Rams, missing a lot of people on defense, and yet they play out of their minds and they outperformed the offense for the Arizona Cardinals, that won them the game. The fact that Matthew Stafford played lights out QB1 play last night, that's why they won. The fact that they played containment defense and didn't necessarily let Kyler Murray run all over the field and go crazy. Yeah, he got away a couple of times, and of course he's going to, but they played containment football. They did it well, and for the most part, they kept him in check, and he's not a pocket quarterback. And because of his height and his lack of height, he didn't have the ability to throw over the big defenders. That's always been a knock on short quarterbacks, which is why typically quarterbacks are 6'2 and above. That's just the way it is. Russell Wilson is just one of those guys who breaks the mold. Six feet, plays like he's 6'4". Kyler Murray, if he can get outside of the defensive box, then he can play big. But if you keep him bottled up, then he can't necessarily do it. It's 50-50 balls. Sometimes he gets lucky. Sometimes he won't. And that's going to be the Achilles heel of an offense being led by Kyler Murray. Simple as one, two, three. If he can't escape, if you've got a defense that is well-versed and they are absolutely unequivocally well-coached to keep him in the box and keep him in the pocket and to play and stay home wherever that home may be for that defender, whether it's a linebacker, whether it's a middle linebacker, whether it's an edge rusher, as long as they stay home and they stay true to their assignments, they can keep somebody like a Kyler Murray in check and they can make him have to play big, but he's not big. He's 5'10". Hard to throw over a 6'5 defender when you're only 5'10". And you can't see over the defenders to begin with. And you got a very big 6'2 and above defensive line right in front of you, along with all your offensive linemen who are equally as big. That was the problem, not the coaching for the Cardinals. Yeah, there are certain things coaching-wise you could pick on. Again, it seemed like an air raid. They threw too much. They couldn't run the ball. Cardinals aren't good running anyways. They've never been a good running team. The teams they've run against have been bad teams with bad records and bad defenses. But they can't run on a good defense because they don't really have a run game. They don't. They got a pretty good run game, but they don't have a top five run game, right? Like the national media wanted you to believe. Because when they went against a real defense, which they went against last night, even though that defense is injury depleted and COVID and other scenarios, they still were able to stop the run because the Cardinals have never been a run team. They're a passing team. And they're not even a team that wins because of the coaching. They're not even a team that wins because they got DeAndre Hopkins. They're a team that wins because Kyler Murray plays out of his mind. And most of the plays that are big for the Cardinals, if you really truly are watching, they're broken plays. It's Kyler Murray eluding the rush, getting away, just making sure that he's got more time than needed so that they can go on scramble drills, get open, he finds the open receiver, he's got a big arm, and he finds the open receiver and makes the play. But they're broken plays. They're not designed plays. Most of the big plays and most of the things that happen offensively for the Cardinals are broken plays, and it's all on the legs and the arm of Kyler Murray. Take Kyler Murray out of that offense and put anybody else in, and you won't have this many wins, you won't have this high of explosive of an offense, 
and you won't have a team that's playing to go in the playoffs. Yeah, Colt McCoy won a couple of games. Timing matters. Look at who they played. Look at where those teams were when they played them. Couldn't put Colt McCoy in now and have him go against 49ers and get a win. Wouldn't happen. Timing matters. There are always variables. And Kyler Murray is the reason why the Cardinals are what they are. Because broken plays, escaping defenders, getting loose, getting open, buying time, scramble deals from receivers, and the scramble drills from the receivers is just a big blessing for him in all honesty because he's got some of the best receivers in the NFL. They're quick, they're fast, they're elusive, they're tall. They've got athletic ability. So when you throw 50-50 balls in the air, chances are they're going to catch that 50-50 ball and it's worked out. But it's not the coaching that's winning the Cardinal games. It's Kyler Murray that's winning the Cardinal games. That is what the national media needs to catch up on and figure out because it's not the coaching. He throws too much. The coach still throws too much. And they rely on the throwing and the air raid too much. And when they try and run, they can't coach it up. And they don't have the players to pull it off. And when they go into the playoffs and it's time to use that run game, And let's say they have to go against the rush defense of the Green Bay Packers, for instance. It's going to be ineffective, just like it was ineffective last night, because the Cardinals are not a running team. If they go against the 49ers, they will not be able to run the ball because the Cardinals are not a rushing team. Can't do it. It's not in their DNA. They're a pass-first team. They're an air raid team. That's what the offense is. But even that offense isn't that good. Because, again, it only works because most of the plays that are big plays are broken plays. you got wide receivers, scramble drills, a quarterback who's fast, he's elusive, he can get away, and he can buy time. And then he finds the open receiver, and he has a big and an accurate, that's the key, he has a big and an accurate arm, and he finds the wide open receivers. But he couldn't do that last night because, A well-disciplined defense kept him in the box, and they made sure he couldn't get outside. They made sure he couldn't get away. And the inside defensive linemen were breaching the offensive line, and they were getting to Kyler Murray with hits, hurries, and sacks. And that is how you beat the Arizona Cardinals, and that is what the L.A. Rams did last night. It was not bad coaching that lost the game, unlike what the national media Want you to believe. So just wanted to make sure that we cleared that up really quickly. All right, here we go. Power rankings for the NFL. Um, Houston Texans coming in at number 32. Previously, they were number 32. So they didn't move anywhere. They stay where they are. Detroit Lions, they are at number 31 with a record of 111 and 1. And their previous ranking was 30, so they fell one spot. Jacksonville went up a spot. They're 2-11. and 11. They were 31. Now they're 30. Now moving up to number 29, you have the New York Jets. They were previously ranked number 29. They are currently number 29, still with a record of 3-10, and 10, still one of the worst teams in the NFL. Chicago Bears staying home as well at number 28 with a record of 4-9. and nine. The New York Giants. Staying home at number 27 with a record of 4-9. and Got to go against the uh, Cowboys on Sunday. Yeah, you might as well just add that to the loss column. Carolina Panthers. Uh, staying home at number 26 as well with a record of 5-8. and eight. Seattle Seahawks. They are staying home at number 25 with a record of 5-8. and eight, But they played really good uh, this past weekend. We're going to go over the results of Sunday, by the way. I know I didn't do it yesterday. We're not going to get to it today. We'll definitely talk results tomorrow, I promise. Uh, number 24, Atlanta Falcons staying home at number 24 with a record of 6-7. and seven. The Las Vegas Raiders, uh, they were number 18. Now they're number 23 with a record of 6-7. and seven. The New Orleans Saints, um, they were previously 22. They are currently number 22 with a record of 6-7, and seven, and they are on the outside looking in in regards to the playoffs. Minnesota Vikings, same thing, outside looking in, previously ranked number 23, now number 21 at 6-7. and seven. Philadelphia Eagles moved up one spot from number 21 to number 20 with a record of 6-7. and seven. The Washington football team dropping from 16 to 19 on 
I'm surprised. I honestly thought they should have dropped further. Uh, they got a record of six and seven. Number 18, Miami Dolphins. Previously number 17, dropping to 18 with a record of six and seven. Uh, previously at 20, jumping up to number 17, you got the Denver Broncos coming in with a record of seven and six. You have the Pittsburgh Steelers, previously 15, now at number 16. Cleveland Browns, previously 19, jumping up to 15 with a record of seven and six. And I don't think that's really too high. They shouldn't have got that big of a jump off that win. They just shouldn't have. Uh, Cincinnati Bengals, dropping from number 11 to 14 with a record of seven and six, still battling for the playoffs. Uh, Indianapolis Colts, dropping from 12 to 13 with a record of 7-6. Of course, obviously, still battling for the playoffs. L.A. Chargers, big game on Thursday against Kansas City, I believe it is. Uh, previously ranked number 13, jumping up to number 12 with a record of 8-5. 49ers, going from 14 to 11 with a record of 7-6, and six, currently in the playoffs at this point in time. Baltimore Ravens, dropping from 6 to 10, deservedly so, with a record of 8-5. and five. Um, Lots of injuries. Lots of questions in regards to Lamar. Is he going to play this week? I know they're saying he is. I just don't know how real that is. Buffalo Bills only dropping to number nine from number eight with a record of seven and six with how many losses in a row? And these guys are still in love with Buffalo? Look, they shouldn't be this high. They shouldn't be in the top 10. And they should have been out of the top 10 a long time ago. I, I, I don't understand it. I dispute it. I disagree with it. L.A. Rams uh, going from number nine to number eight with a record of nine and four. Tennessee Titans from 10 to 7, deservedly so, uh, with a record of 9 and 4. Number 6, Cowboys going from 7 to 6 with a record of 9 and 4. The New England Patriots from 4 to 5 with a record of 9 and 4. Kansas City Chiefs from 5 to 4. No, absolutely not. That's a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, New England should be above Kansas City still. But again, KC going from 5 to 4 with a record of 9 and 4. Number 3, Green Bay Packers. Uh, going from two to three with a record of 10 and three. Number two, Arizona Cardinals dropping from one to two, deservedly so, with a record of 10 and three after the loss last night to the LA Rams. Uh, three to one, surprise, surprise, because they're so in love with these guys. Tampa Bay Buccaneers, 10 and three, jumping from number three to number one. All right, that's going to do it for today's podcast. A uh, lot of stuff to get into, obviously, but tomorrow we'll have to get into the rest of it including the results from the games that were played on Sunday and talk a little bit about those teams and what they've got coming up this weekend. You guys enjoy the rest of your day and we will talk tomorrow.